Hello, my name is Chris Roberts, the host of The Long Road. I'm here with Dean Eaton, and um, we're going to talk about organ donations, something that's near and dear to your heart and about a another 100,000 families around the nation. But before we go into that, <clears throat> we've got two things. One, we hear you on the radio. You're a big advocate about um, buying locally. Can you tell, a little, tell the guests a little bit about that? Sure. Um, for the 18 years that I've had uh, my business here in Keene, I've, I've uh, pushed for shopping not only locally, but at locally owned businesses. Because for every dollar that you spend uh, locally, 70% of it stays in the community and turns again and again. If you spend money at a local store that's not locally owned, only 40% of it stays local. And if you go shop on the internet, obviously that money is just gone Going. forever. So. Uh, so the benefits to, uh, to shopping locally are many, and, and, and all those people support the local, local charities and, and uh, events and uh, a variety of things that, that make that money turn again and turn again. And so, for example, United Way is hopefully going to raise $2.2 .2 million, and a lot of that comes from local employees at local businesses. Exactly, exactly. And you've moved your business downtown and it seems to have had a big effect even on the employment downtown it's been a <laughs> being on main street has been a wonderful thing for me um it you know for me and personally in my business it's been um very good it's exceeded our our expectations and our projections um if i if i had stayed where i was i don't think i'd be saying anything happy to you right now um, it seems to have had a great benefit on other people downtown. Uh, the businesses, businesses have told me that they've increased their hours, they've added uh, or opened Sunday, which they've never done, or without increasing hours that their traffic has increased. So uh, it seems to have had a benefit for everybody. But there's a whole lot. You know, I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I'll take some credit. I think I'm the anchor store downtown now. But, uh, but there's a lot of several new businesses downtown, and, and uh, everybody's contributed. We have a Main Street that anybody in this, any city in this country would love to have. It's all locally owned businesses, and they're thriving. And did we, is it correct when it said in the paper that you hired, what, 12 people for the Christmas season? We, uh, when I, I used to be have a five people full and part-time at the other store. Downtown I had uh, uh, 12 or 17, I'm sorry, I can't remember. <laughs> but I now have 30 for the holidays, yes. I, I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that I would employ 30 people. And you made a lot of people happy, and you gave them a good Christmas. You bet. Well, now we go to another one. Hopefully, I don't embarrass you. you yeah, I don't think you can. <laughs> well, my wife, some of her friends, her sister, as far as they were concerned, you were the Mr. Dreamy. <laughs> the, okay, you embarrassed me. When you were in the high school, <laughs> the sophisticated, suave French teacher. Oh, wow, okay. They were kids. They were <laughs> seeing through a different filter. Okay. They were, so. Yeah, I always saw myself as sort of a geek, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. But a lot of those 16, 17-year-old girls, yeah. you were the French guy, the romantic language. Yeah, <laughs> fresh out of college. I wore boots. I had a big mustache, long hair, yeah. <laughs> so my wife would probably tick, get all ticked off that I, I brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> I usually don't write things down. But when I was doing the research, this was so important. And it is so widespread. And there's so much information that, that people don't understand about mm -hmm. organ Donation. So some of the questions I have are written down so I could sure. get them um, straight. So can we t talk a little bit about why you're into organ donations? Sure. Um, my wife um, it was it been diabetic since she was a child, 11 years old, I believe. And around the age of 28, she um, started to have problems. And she, her vision problems, until one day she was driving down West Street and couldn't see to turn around. And that was the last day she ever drove. She lost her vision very, very quickly. Uh, not completely, not black blind, but um, with diabetic retinopathy, breaking the blood vessels. Uh, uh, she's now legally blind and has been ever since. And uh, very quickly thereafter, uh, had complete kidney failure. Um, so she had a, she was a, a very, very fortunate to have a large family. Um, she's one of seven. And her oldest brother was an identical match. I mean, in those, these days they can match pretty well without all the same matches they used to. But they used to have six categories that they had to match in, and she matched all six with him. So it was like having her own kidney back when she got it, you know, a living donor. Um, and, and life was very good. Uh, although she did, uh, she did contract a, a virus because of her immunosuppressed mm -hmm. system 
It settled in her spine and paralyzed her. And, and uh, for 30 days, she was in Boston with uh, tubes down her throat, couldn't speak, couldn't talk, couldn't see. Uh, but she learned, uh, she had to learn to walk again. And then went back to school and got her uh, master's degree down in Boston and, and in social services. And for more than 20 plus years, has worked at the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Kidney transplant, any transplant may not last forever. And uh, hers lasted, uh, it, it took almost a little over 20 years for her diabetes to complain her to take her first kidney. It took about that long to uh, take the second one that her brother gave her. She then got a transplant from her sister. Uh, again, so fortunate mm -hmm. to have a living donor. But before she would ask another sibling, she said, I'm not going to have this happen again. Um, and she got a pancreas transplant, which was pretty new at the time. Uh, came from a nine-year-old boy who died, but for the first time in her life, or since 11 years old, she was not diabetic, which meant not sticking mm -hmm. herself with needles, you know, four, six, 12 times a day. Uh, being able to eat what she wanted, go where she wanted without having to worry about whether she had insulin with her, whether she had eaten correctly, how active she was going to be, or how idle she was going to be. And, uh, and that lasted about 10 years. And so the pancreas is pretty important for insulin production? or a Pancreas is all about in in insulin production, yes. Uh, that's what regulates it for the body. Uh, it just changed her life <laughs> completely. I mean, she just, uh, she knew a freedom that she had never, ever known since she was a child, and it was just uh, wonderful. She currently is uh, in kidney failure again. The pancreas did fail, but she's now in uh, kidney failure again. And uh, she does have other siblings who would donate, but she's uh, not going to go that route this time. She's on a waiting list for a kidney transplant, hoping that, uh, that a younger kidney, because all of her brothers are in their, you know, all the brothers and sisters are in their 50s or 60s, uh, hoping that a 25-year-old you know, or 30-year-old kidney will uh, suit her better. Uh, so that's where we are at the moment, and that is why it's very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> and <clears throat> but you're listening to what you talk about your wife, she's both a fighter and then also she appreciates what happened, so she's trying to, he to help other people in the same or like situation. Yes. And, and that's really important. She, and she is a fighter. You know, she's been knocked down and she gets up, and she's been knocked down and she gets up. And, and the older you get, the harder that gets. You know, you and I both know that, yeah. just trying to get up from a sitting <laughs> position on the floor. But... Uh, <clears throat> um, but she, she just, yeah, she just keeps going, and it's, and it's been very difficult. The complications can be many. Some people have it very smooth. Um, Carol has had every opportunistic thing that could get into her, get into her, whether it's meningitis or uh, uh, she was in the hospital last year for 10 days with, at the end of 10 days, the doctor said, we're not sure why you came in, what it was that brought you in, and we're not sure what we did to fix it, but we're gonna get you out of here because uh, we could keep you forever. You're a great case study. <laughs> well, one of the things growing up and listening for watching about heart transplants when they became, it suppressed, they used to suppress the immune system so bad, so normal things that would not have bothered you or I could be deadly to transplant. Exactly, just a simple cold, yep. Uh, that, and I think that's gotten much better. Um, all, of, all of the medicine, obviously, over the last 20 years has gotten so much better. And you still have to take immunosuppressants once you've had a transplant for the rest of your life, no matter what. Um, and, and some people, it, it Let's opportunistic things in. Other people are, are, you know, have systems that seem to sail through it okay. Um, transplants have a lot of myths. A lot of people say, you know what, I don't want to sign my name for a transplant I'm, to be a donor because the doctor isn't, doctor's more worried about getting credit for the transplant. So <laughs> if something's wrong with me, the doctor's not going to do everything to save me just so he can harvest my, my organs. Yeah, that's an awful myth. It's, a, it's an awful myth out there. I mean, the doctors do everything that they would ever do. They never look at somebody and say, oh, we have a possible organ donor here. Let's let them go. That will just never happen. It just won't happen. And um, so people can register on their driver's license. I think it was 42, 43 states plus the District of Columbia gives the people the option mm -hmm. to put it on the driver's license. Yes, and lots of people do, and that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> But what has to happen is, that, is to give organs, other than your eyes and maybe a couple of other um, skin things, is you know, to, to, to give a heart or a lung or a kidney or something. When you die, you have to be brain dead. And, and that obviously is not the case with everybody who dies. So a very special set of circumstances has to happen. If you're in a situation where you're brain dead, I mean, you've perhaps been in a car accident and your license is on some police officer's clipboard or it's at the hospital desk or all your clothes just got thrown into a bag when they brought you in and nobody's even looked at it. The most important thing you can do is tell your family. 
They make the decision. The, the, the doctors have to ask about, uh, are you willing to donate? And they make that decision, not you. No matter what you've signed. Because that was one of the things where I was reading and it says, talk to your family, talk to your family, because if any family member says no, it doesn't matter all your wishes. The doctors will not harvest any organs. Right. The next of kin, whoever, whoever next really of is the next of kin who's most important. Point. I mean, in my case, yeah. it would just take one. I mean, if, if, a, if a spouse says yes, the children can't over, yeah. overrule that. Uh, but I've always said there are three, there's three rules, and that is tell your family, tell your family, okay. tell your family. That's, that's really the key. They're the ones who've got to know and got to make that decision and be on board with it. I mean, the more you tell them and talk about it, the more they are on board. Some people don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, I knew uh, one woman who uh, had been approached about or donating her son's organs. She couldn't stand the thought of him being parceled out and not being in the grave for her to go visit. And I can't argue with that. I think it's wrong, but I can't argue with it. That, that's a really emotional, personal yep. thing. You just can't argue with that. Other people love the idea that their, that their uh, deceased loved one has, has uh, helped so many other people or is living on in other people. Well, that goes to a couple other myths. Is One, people will say, well, my religion bans me from donating organs. Total myth. There is, not a, there is not a major religion that... Uh, not only do they not disapprove of it, they approve of it. Um, every major religion will, uh, will say, and, and if there's any issues with it, you know, talk to your clergy person. But uh, all religions do, do uh, support it. And the other one, it was amazing how many, if, if you donate organs, you can't have an open casket. It, it kind of like people <laughs> go, if you're donating, all, it's like going to a butcher or a slaughterhouse, they're just going in and just taking the vital organs and doesn't care about the dignity of the body. You have been doing your research for sure. <laughs> the doctors <clears throat> harvest organs. They don't butcher. You can have, you can donate heart, lungs, kidney, bones, tissue, eyes, everything, skin, and still have an open casket funeral. These organs are harvested and they're harvested with care. Uh, and you can be very presentable in an open casket. There's one that's um, right now in the United States is 86 million people with driver's license have signed off saying they're willing to donate in case of death in an accident. That's up 24 percent um, in 2007. So almost one out of every three Americans are starting to understand and the benefit of donating mm -hmm. organs. Next step would be two out of three and then three out of three. three. And... Um, <clears throat> The, the other part of it, okay, um, in 2009, 28,000 um, people, well, 20, there was 28,000 transplants of different types of organs. Let's see if I got numbers that, uh, I, I, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> I did bring some numbers yeah. about that stuff. Um, but there were 100,000 people, more than 100,000 100, people, people waiting. waiting. And, and that's <clears throat> what points up the, the, the critical importance of, of uh, being willing to do this. And because it is such rare situations that allow you to do that. Almost 6,400 um, people in last year died waiting for organ transplants. It's a lot of people every that's single <clears throat> day. A lot of people every day dying waiting for an organ transplant. And um, when you're talking about multiple donors, with the numbers that I, <clears throat> 28,000 28, transplants, but there was only a little bit more than 14,000 donors. Right, and right. <clears throat> and so that at least two, that's almost, that's at least two per person. Mm -hmm. One person can affect, uh, uh, can really affect and save the lives of at least eight people. You've got heart, two lungs, uh, yeah. liver, kidney, two kidneys rather, and uh, intestines. Uh, those can all be very important. But you can also not just save lives, but really affect the quality of life for people who have uh, bone diseases or skin diseases by, by offering tissue and bones. Uh, and then you have the eyes, the, the corneal transplants that allow people to see, someone who's never seen their child to, to see them up close, or someone who's never been able to run a base in a, you know, in a baseball game to be able to run. And the, um, <clears throat> you were talking, oh, excuse me, there was a story about uh, a man who lost, the unthinkable, in two separate accidents, lost two sons, his only two sons. And each one of them he allowed to give 
everything and anything they could possibly use. And uh, he saved the lives of or improved the quality of life for 98 people. You had just, while I was gagging, you, you brought my line. <laughs> <clears throat> because also, more and more people, once they donate the organs, they want to maintain a connection with, with the person. Where I've seen where some parents, the child may be nine, ten years old, something happens to that child, unfortunately, but the parents donate as much as they can, and it's almost kind of like a living connection. Their child is living through a mm -hmm. number of other people. When uh, Carol had her pancreas transplant, as I said, came from a, a nine-year-old boy, we both wanted to be in touch with that family. And the uh, hospital the hospital is the mediary. You cannot yeah. go directly to that family. Uh, so Carol did write a letter, which presumably was delivered by the hospital to the family, and she never heard a thing back. Those people did not want to know anything or see anything or hear anything after that. They, they did the right thing. They did a good thing. Didn't want to know. Uh, there's, a, there's a woman here in town who lost a uh, three-year-old daughter many years ago now, uh, choking on a sandwich, and she donated organs. And I asked her if she would ever want to meet the families or know anything about them, and she said, no, I wouldn't. She said it was enough that I did it. Uh, she said I might someday want to see who got her heart. <clears throat> well, yeah, because a lot of those, but for a lot of people, they feel the heart is the soul. Right. The heart is the, the person. Right. And when you're talking about hearts, they were talking, one thing was every 16 minutes in the United States, someone goes on the waiting list for a heart transplant. Mm -hmm. This is stunning, <clears throat> isn't it? it? It's really, so in the time of this show, four people yeah. will now need a heart transplant to hopefully to live because without the heart transplant, congested heart failure, their lungs are going to go, their quality of life is basically yeah. done. Well, people think of something that's very <clears throat> remote, and, it's, and it's, uh, it's not. I mean, four people an hour, it's, it's huge. And there's something like five, uh, almost 5,000 people in New England right now waiting for organ transplants. That's a lot <clears throat> of people, and it's pretty likely you know some of yeah. those people. Let's go to the ones that I go, the guy from um, Neil Young takes drugs, shoots up, big alcohol. All of a sudden, he, he has a liver. I think it was a liver. He goes, okay, I'm going in. I go to UCL and get a liver transplant. And I go, why would I want to sign up for a do um, <clears throat> donate my organs to someone who has a lot of money and someone that just seems to pop to the list? How do people move up on the list? There is the United Network for Organ Sharing, which coordinates it throughout the country, I believe. And um, it's, it's, there's a number of factors that go into it. Part of it is, is region, because if, for instance, if you are getting a lung or heart transplant, you need to live where that's coming from. You can't transport it. Or something whereas, like four hours, I think. Yeah, yeah, you've got a very limited window. Uh, Carol's pancreas was done in Minnesota, and uh, we heard the news at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, they called us. And, and I have to say, when we got the phone call, we cried, not because she was getting an organ, but because they told us it was coming from a nine-year-old boy. It was, it was a very emotional moment. But it was the earliest flight we could get to Minnesota was the next morning at 5 o'clock, and we had that time. It was the following afternoon that she got the transplant. Uh, so, so regional uh, factors go, go into consideration. How close they think you are to dying moves you up or down that list. Um, whether you are yourself an organ donor may may affect that list. Uh, Carol's uh, oldest brother, who gave her her first kidney, uh, yes, kidney, is now on a waiting list for a kidney transplant. Now, this is this is this is fascinating. He gave her his kidney, um, one of his kidneys, because of his activities when he was a young man in college. Um, he has hepatitis C or contracted hepatitis C. He was and his liver failed. He received half a liver from his adopted son. So that's how, they yeah. good, how good they've gotten at being able to match without all the, all the match things being there, um, which, which just brought him back to complete health. But since then, his, uh, his other kidney has failed. Uh, so he's on a waiting list. Um, because he is already an organ donor, he's a little bit higher than other people might be. But there's a number of factors that go into that. And how much money you have is zero on that list. The, um does how well you take care of yourself 
make a determination if if I have congested hop failure and I'm a drinker and I'm a smoker and I'm 50, 60 pounds overweight, that, would that have an effect or would they it'd be kind of like if I give you a hot, chances are you could be back here in three or four years? You know, I don't know the exact <coughs> answer to that. I, 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 they certainly assess whether they're going, they're putting this into a high risk patient who's going to, to <coughs> have another organ failure because of lifestyle right away. Um, and yet I know somebody here in Keene who got uh, an organ transplant who was a heavy, heavy drinker and got a liver transplant and has not drunk since. <laughs> well, <laughs> at least he won. Yeah. I mean, he, he learned. The, um, <clears throat> the other one, again, for example, blacks or African Americans. The federal government is done some really nasty experiments on them, like the Tuskegee with the syphilis and allow them to... Let. And so, are organ donations limited to race? Or can they? Organ donation is not limited <coughs> to race. There are sometimes genetic factors that will make that uh, work better within a race or gender. But, but uh, under no circumstances. Uh, let's see. I can answer that one really well here. <laughs> Um, the matching of blood type and body size is really what matters. You know, a, a child mm -hmm. needs an organ from a child. You can't put my liver or your liver in, into a newborn baby. Uh, but often, they are enhanced by matching organs between members of the same ethnic or racial groups. But that's not, but that doesn't determine how it's given. And because um, <clears throat> I was looking at the research, I noticed that blacks are donating more and receiving more, but Hispanics are increasing but for some reason, Asians just don't want to donate or just haven't been motivated to donate. Maybe we have to get out there, explain it better to them? I don't know what the reason would be. I don't know if it's part of their um, the <coughs> religious upbringing that would affect something, uh, their, their feelings about you know, their body being some kind of temple or something. But, um, but, out, but outreach, <laughs> surely. I mean, shows yeah. like this are, 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 are what make the difference. Uh, Let's go back to shopping locally. Okay. People would come into my store and say, I'm shopping locally for the first time because I heard your ad, because yep. it makes sense. <clears throat> and it's not that they don't care, or, but they just don't think about it. And when they hear it, they get it. And the same is true when you talk about organ donation. The more you pump that information out there, they go, oh, yeah, you know, that could be me who needs it, or I could be the one who helps. Or, uh, so, yeah, information outreach. Do I have to be in great health to donate organs? It's better if you are, <laughs> uh, but you should age or, or, your, or the condition of your health is, is, uh, should not be your, con your concern. It should be the doctor's. If you die in a situation where you're, when you're brain dead and, and organs might be mm -hmm. harvested, if you're a willing donor and your family is willing, let the doctor make that determination. So I could be overweight or have a bad heart condition, but I may have perfect eyes. So they could use my, my corneas. Yep. Yep. Um, obesity is, is an issue for uh, receiving organs, I think, but not necessarily for donating. So, so your, the condition of your body is, uh, you know, you may, you may be overweight, you may be a heavy drinker, you may, there may be any number of things that you've done that aren't really good to your body, but you may still have organs that are viable to donate. And maybe, and maybe only skin and tissue or something. And, well, skin and tissue, that's extremely important for, sure. for burn victims, mm -hmm. especially younger children. Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> is there an age limit? If, if I'm 70 years old and I'm like Jack Lorraine and all my... <laughs> <laughs> you sell his juicer? <laughs> yes. No, I don't sell his juicer, no. <laughs> <clears throat> but it, 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 it all depends on, on the quality of your organs, not really the age? Correct. I mean, uh, uh, you're, again, with Carol's situation, they, they really feel like they'd rather <coughs> give her a 25-year-old kidney than a 60-year-old kidney. But that's not to say that she couldn't receive her sister's kidney at age, you know, who's 60 years old, and, and be very healthy with it. Um, again, that's, a, that's something that you want to let the doctors determine. If you're a willing donor and your family's willing to, to have your organs donated, let the doctor determine. There is no age limit. Okay. So one, like we already talked about. <clears throat> so, for example, again, when we were growing up, and uh, was it Dr. Jarvis from South Africa who did the first heart transplant? And we were talking last year, 
almost 2,200, in 2006, almost 2,200 hot transplants, and the average age is 55 years old. So you're expanding the quality of life for another 20 or 30 years. Yep. You're giving these people the opportunity to see their children graduate from high school or even hold it, their grandkids. We, we exactly. We, we <coughs> both know that 55 is pretty young and you've got a lot of productive things to do in your life still. And um, <coughs> so other important things, what are some other important things when it comes to donating? Um, Live, live donation, and, you know, again, Carol's been the beneficiary of two live donations, um, is, uh, is more and more uh, feasible and more and more desirable. Um, so if you're in need of an organ transplant and you're on a waiting list, you can do a number of things. First of all, just tell all your friends. Tell everybody you know. Um, you can put it on Facebook. You can put it on Twitter. Get the word out. There may be somebody out there who, there are people out there who say, you know, I've let a blessed life and maybe it's time for me to give something back. I mean that's a pretty serious yeah. big thing to do. Yeah. But there are people who do that and you might be a beneficiary of that. Um, there is, it was in uh, yesterday's paper, uh, it was on NPR and it's going to be on 2020 I believe. Here in Keene there was a woman who needed a uh, kidney transplant and had a sibling willing to donate. This just happened last yeah. week out in uh, Michigan or Minnesota, one of those states out there in the Midwest, uh, there was somebody else who needed a transplant and had a sibling willing to know, donate. But both of them were better matches <laughs> for the other one. So they did that. They harvested one here, flew it out there, they harvested one there and flew it back here. Um, so both siblings donated, but to strangers uh, to save their own sibling's life, which is just an amazing thing. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. So there's a story to watch for that's coming up. So, Keene, New Hampshire. Yeah. So on kidneys, you can donate one whole ki ki kidney. And be healthy for the rest of your life. For, and it's a liver where you can, they can slice out part of it and, and donate it. and Give half your liver and it will grow back in both the donor yeah. and the recipient. Um, so if you have family that uh, is willing, uh, and again, it's a big deal and uh, a lot to consider, but uh, hopefully most families would do it. And uh, usually, I mean, if you're, if you're, there are no other no repercussions except for the health conditions that you may already have. And, and like you talked earlier, modern medicine has changed so drastically. I remember in 73 when I had my first knee surgery, I spent 10 days in the hospital, eight weeks in a full leg cast. <clears throat> in 2007, I had my next knee surgery. Get up, walk, get out. Get up and, and walk. <laughs> and a couple of days later, I'm, I'm walking. So a live donation is nowhere near as risky as it used to be. Right. Um, but it's still risk. All surgeries have risk. All surgeries have risk. <clears throat> and I think if you're donating a kidney, it's probably it's a little more painful for the uh, donor than it is for the recipient. Um, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's an act of love <laughs> that just doesn't compare to, to other things. Um, there's also, I did not know until today, because uh, I was just doing a little extra <laughs> research myself, there's a, uh, a, talking about the people who just crossed over with Michigan, the Alliance for Paired Donation. So you, and you can go out the, on the internet these days, which you couldn't do back yeah. when Carol started, and, and uh, just type in you know, uh, organ donation, and you'll see some of these options. But the Alliance for Paired Donation, the kidney registry, matchingdonor.com, and that's where you may match somebody else, and they may match you, where you can share. Um, have one of your siblings give to somebody else and get it from them. So there, there, there are certainly other options out there. And because <clears throat> I had a rare tumor, thinoma, that was in, the, in my chest that was causing a lot of problems. But the problem with the thinoma, the thymus is really important to your immune system. And as I get older, because I don't have the thymus and I'm not producing all the T cells, I get sicker and sicker at times and I'm at, at greater risk. Yep. And so, <clears throat> so for a number of people, simple things like that that help p improve your quality of life when you were 20 or 30 years old may now have a, a negative effect on you at 50 or 60 that may end up putting you on a transplant list or something. So like you were talking about your wife, she got 
20 years, if it takes 20 years to, before it's destroyed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's just not thinking of the near and now. Right. And so right. if someone says, well, nothing I have to worry about, but all of a sudden you get older, you may have some family genetic problems mm -hmm. that are going on and saying, holy crap, <laughs> it's get on the list. Like you're talking about switching and if you help someone out, someone may end up helping you out. That's the way it's supposed to work, yes. And um, we always talk about <clears throat> organ donated. What about bone marrow? That seems to be pretty important, especially for little kids with cancer. Bone marrow is a separate registry, and it doesn't seem to fall under the category of organ donation. So I, I, I don't know a lot about it. Um, we've, I've seen these registries here in Keene where they you know, had drives for, for local children who had uh, needed bone marrow transplants and uh, people have gotten tested, and then they stay in the registry. You know, a lot of these people who are willing to test for somebody locally are also willing to leave their names in there to test for somebody you know, in California or Texas or Florida or wherever. Uh, I know one of the women here in Keene who, who did get, uh, have her bone marrow tested said you can, actually it wasn't tested, she donated. She said, I have two requests. She said, not go to a rapist or a murderer. She said, after that, you can do what you want. And I don't know how much the control she had over that. But, well, but that was her request, and it was a, seemed like a reasonable one. Because I know I've been noticing with, with the Cheshire Fair and a lot of places, they're having bone marrow registries. Mm -hmm. And what, <clears throat> it's not the same thing with, with organ donors, but one of the big problems they have with bone marrow is with the multiracial, multi-ethnicity of them because now we have more <clears throat> biracial families, and it gets really tough to really get the, those matches where... So that one is racially sensitive, bone That's marrow. pretty... is getting racially sensitive because you don't have an... You really don't have a great number of biracial people in the United mm -hmm. States. And <clears throat> like we know, that there's certain, for example, Jewish people, certain Orthodox Jews from different parts, say Russia and everything, have certain um, genetic diseases mm. and genetic... De Deposition, you know what I'm trying to say? Deposed to certain yep, illnesses. Yeah, yep, disposed, yep. <clears throat> and um, so let's talk about some of the ethical problems about donate. And we have more people, hopefully it's not too many, who are now going overseas to get organ donations. Actually, they're, they're really buying organ donors. That puts um, a bad taste in some people's mouths, saying the world isn't being fair. If, <clears throat> if I have money and my child's really sick, if I go to India or I go to China, I can get it. But if you're just a hard-working person, nothing helps your child. We all know that uh, people with money can get some things that other people can't. Um, we all know that, uh, that the world is not fair yeah. to all of us at all times. <clears throat> and, uh, Hopefully, we learn to live with some of those things. But there is an act, there is a national law in the United States that you cannot buy or sell an organ. So within the United States, that's that's not going to happen. Um, if it happens overseas, if they can, you know, if somebody with money can find a willing donor overseas, the trouble is, I mean, then you have to define willing. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what kind of circumstances are these people in that they have to feel like they have to sell an organ? You know, if it's just plain charity on their part, saying, yeah, I'll. Uh, there are some ethical issues, uh, but within the United States, See, those, don't, those things don't happen. That can't happen here. Well, I know the, um, the guy at UCLA when I was stationed out in California, he's in jail now because he was harvesting corneas off of people who were donating their body for medical science, and mm -hmm. he was harvesting some of the other ones and putting money in, in his pocket, which is totally unethical, yeah. and it just... It blows a lot of people's minds. And you can't, you can't, you can't stop, stop some of that. I mean, you you know, when I hire somebody in my ex store, I expect nobody ever to, to, to pocket yeah. any of that money. But in 18 years, that's going to happen. You know, it, it's in a restaurant. You don't expect people to give away free food, but it's going to happen. It's, uh... <clears throat> the, um, we, we hear cases every now and then of people getting um, donations. And they ended up with cancer, or they ended up with hepatitis C, or whatever. If if a heart only has four hours, 
isn't there going to be some risk that you're not going to be able to test everything? Uh, from the donor, yes, that certainly is, is, is possibly a risk. I mean, cert- for the recipient, <coughs> presumably, they've had, they've had yeah. a very extensive yeah. workup. Uh, from the donor, yes, I don't think you can test everything. They will not take organs from someone who can, has cancer, uh, is my understanding. And, you know, I, I stand they, to be corrected. They, yeah, but, kind of no. But my understanding <coughs> is if they know you have cancer, they will not accept your organs. And, but there's one, if you're in a situation and it's a life and death situation and you don't have much time, you love someone, you don't want to lose somebody, you're not really going to say, I want a perfect organ, mm-hmm. I want a no-risk organ, or allow your, some, your, yep. your significant other or someone that's really important to you to pass on. Yep. <clears throat> and, and some people who get healthy organs just... Your body, I mean, your body works hard to reject those, no matter what it is. And, and some people really do reject, and, and uh, you just don't live a good life afterwards. Uh, it's, it's happened. Uh, uh, I knew a gentleman whose mother donated a kidney, and, and uh, it failed. I mean, she was a perfect match for him, but it failed. Um, and uh, he started, he was diabetic. He started losing fingers and toes. And eventually he said, I'm done, and, and you know, just uh, allowed himself to die. You, you don't know always. <coughs> Uh, the, uh, on ABC News a couple nights ago, they did talk about uh, hearts used to have to be put on ice, I mean, all the organs, yep. put on ice and then moved, and then for every hour on ice, you have to take that one hour and uh, you know, thaw it back yep. open. They are now transporting beating living hearts, which is just stunning that they can do that. And I don't recall the, where, you know, the where of all, wherewithal of it, but uh, they're doing it. Well, you, which gives you a longer <coughs> period. You know, if you've got a heart that's beating all the way through, you've got a, lo- you know, a larger window to get that heart into a body. But that also comes to some of the, the people's... Are you still alive? <laughs> and it's... <clears throat> when, if I come in and the doctor says, my wife is brain dead, but her heart's beating, and it's like, well, it's only beating because we put it on a machine... But if I can see my hot, my wife's stomach going up, chest going up and down, and I can see her lungs going up and down, th- that's a really, really tough battle to go it's and say. Wrenching. It, it doesn't matter if the machine is flatline, there's no brave activity. People just don't want to give up. Yeah. And so <clears throat> that's a real emotional pod on the family that's going to, thinking about giving the do- donation. That's got to be emotional, emotional <clears throat> for the surgeons, too. And, um, but what about the emotional effect, you and your wife, going back and forth? Because some of you have those kind of pager on, waiting for the rings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you know, in Carol's, in my case, uh, we, you know, we, we learned a long time ago to count our blessings. You know, God is good to us all the time, and we just thank our blessings uh, all the time. She's been in situations enough times, enough tough situations that most people, or a lot of people, would have just let go. Uh, both of our families say, you know, I don't know how you do it. And it's, you know, we both happen to have the inner strength that goes with that. So, um, so we're blessed. So you, you really, you have to have the will to live. Yes. Sometimes you've got one foot in the grave mm-hmm. and you're saying, you know what, it's easy to just go, I've had enough. But other times say, so you know what? I want to live. I got better days yep. in front of me. I, I want to see the rest of my family. I want to enjoy life. Yeah, and that time may come for Carol. I mean, she's she's had uh, times that were very close, where she just said, "I just don't think I can do this anymore." But then she started to get better. She <laughs> said, "Well, I, maybe I can give it another <laughs> shot." <laughs> That's what life's about. Yeah, that is life's about. One of the reasons that I <clears throat> we were going to do this in January, but I decided it was better to do it in December. Because, unfortunately, this is a part of the year where people want to celebrate, but they also want to be, some people will be stupid. And will, unfor- some people are going to die. There's going to be tragedies and victims over the Alcohol holidays. Alcohol-related parties. Alcohol-related parties. And it's going to, the unfortunate, there'll, there'll be children, there'll be young people whose lives will be, snuffed out way before their time. And 
this is the opportunity for family members and other ones to give the gift of life to a lot of other people. It's a huge gift. It is. And, and it, it, I know it sounds gruesome <clears throat> at Christmas to say, well, you know, people are going to die on the roads, you know, at New Year's parties and so forth, uh, or snow blizzards, whatever. But you're right. <clears throat> it's a time where, where uh, it might happen more often. And, and to, any opportunity yeah. to create that awareness is a good one. Um, if you did it in, in January, it'd be great. If you did it in April, it'd be great. You, but uh, but you're right. This is a. Um, this is never a wrong time to put this in front of people. It, it's never a wrong time, and it's always a tough time when the decision has to come. I just can't see anybody having to make a much worse decision mm -hmm. because <clears throat> my shoot, it's like my mother died December 16th last year. She had a, a major stroke, and it was. <clears throat> it was painful, it was about five or six days and going up and down, all of a sudden you hit that gas of breath and it was like, oh, it's done and over with, and then you're getting ready, then all of a sudden it would come back. And so if you're a family member there going back and forth, back and forth, that would probably be one of the last things that you would be thinking about. But for the doctor, the doctor would be going saying, you know, we got to be careful, we don't, if we put it out with too long, you can then damage the organ so the organs are no longer yep. transplantable. Yep. I think a lot of states, and it may be national, but I think it's a lot of state, individual states have laws where you're required, doctors are required to ask if uh, they're willing to do organ donation. But you don't ask until <laughs> there's no other it choice. Fits. And then you have to have that family come to grips with that reality. Um, if they don't, and the time, you know, if they take too long making that decision, then that that's just the way it rolls. It's, uh, you can't expect somebody, some people yeah. to make that decision immediately. Um, if, if somebody who's listening to this has made it very clear to their family that they want their organs donated, then a family will come to terms with it much more quickly. People also talk about men, uh, donating their bodies to science to be studied, which ultimately will perhaps prevent a need for some organ donation. But you can't just die and say, okay, let's donate to science. You have to make that arrangement ahead of time with a medical school. So if you have any interest in, in uh, arranging with a, in donating your, uh, your, your body for medical science, contact Dartmouth or, or Boston or somewhere and, and make arrangements ahead of time. They won't just take you out of the blue. The, um, you've talked about a number of people from Keene who are getting donations, Dona donors, donations. It is donations, but it seems kind of yeah. weird saying donations. But um, are there hospitals around here that do transplants, or is it just the big ones? Dartmouth, Dartmouth is doing a lot of transplants. Now, when Carol had her pancreas, we went to Minnesota. We got on their list out there and went there because the gentleman out there had done more than anybody in the world, and they had done <coughs> a 1,000 of them out there. Boston had done five. So we just thought, let's <laughs> go with the experience. Um, we could have had it done in Boston. Boston has done a lot more now, so there's tons of organ uh, transplants happening in Boston. Um, Dartmouth, Hitchcock in Lebanon now has a very good program. We've been working with a doctor up there who oversees their transplant program, and he's as familiar with it as anybody. So um, it's close by. You can get it done close by. That, 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 that peace of mind of understanding the quality of the doctor. And when, when I had my thinoma, and it had been, been less than 1,000 reported, and went to one hospital, the guy says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, bang, bang, bang. You just didn't get that right feeling. Then I went to UCLA, and the guy goes, yep, does it, and you're sitting there, and he's personally taking care of you, and he says, you know what, this is so rare, we want to do it all for free. So you can just sign mm -hmm. so my, my students, because most of my students will never see this in, in their whole career. But it was, I went in there. And I just felt so comfortable. He was a quality doctor. He yeah. sat down and explained it to me, all the risk. And he says, if it had gone into this, we're going to have to take part of your lung out. We're going to have to take the, um, the aorta arch out. And it's like, but it was so comfortable. So that, really, yeah. that doctor really has to be important. And you have to advocate for yourself. You have to ask questions. You have to pay attention. And that's why it's always good to go to the doctor with somebody else because... You come out there, well, wait, 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 what did he say? What did he, if you get two sets of ears, two sets of eyes, you, you've got to advocate for yourself. So you, you probably like my wife, when, whenever we went to these, for some, she'd be having a note and pad writing everything down because you write Tris a couple of times, it's, what, what did he say? What yeah. did she say? Yeah. And 
And it's emotional, and, and too. And for you as, the opo- as the patient, there's so much emotion involved that some of these things just go right out. And so, yeah, you got to write it down and, and double-check. Mm-hmm. So, well, we're getting ready to, to wrap this up. I, think I we didn't provided. think we were going to fill 45 minutes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It, it's, it's a lot of information yeah. out there. It's things that people should know. And <clears throat> there's, there's a number of website, websites to go out, go out if people have questions. I know that the Mayo Clinic, since you're talking about Minnesota, is, has a, a wealth of knowledge out there. Minnesota's loaded with great hospitals. We went to the University of Minnesota uh, at Fairchild, and uh, everybody assumed we were at the Mayo. <laughs> they are loaded with great clinics out there. But for information about organ donation, UNOS, United Network for Organ Sharing, uh, Living Bank, go, there's, there's two right away. Go to the Kidney, National Kidney Foundation, uh, any a number of groups like that uh, if you want more information. But UNOS is the, probably the primary one. Well, I just thought of one before. A couple of years ago in France where they had the first face transplant. Mm-hmm. And I, to me, I could see donating all the organs because they're inside. <clears throat> but donating your, your face to someone else, that, that could be kind of a... Nobody, the, the bone structure is different, yeah. though, so nobody in that family of the person who, the deceased person, would ever recognize that person because it's a total different bone. facial structure that it's sitting over, uh, and that changes everything. I mean, it'd be, <laughs> it, I, I, it could be very freaky, yes, if they, if they looked a lot alike, but uh, uh, I, I think that just is not the case. Okay. So, again, if you have anything else to say before we wrap this up, I... Um, Tell your family, tell, tell your, your family, family, tell your, your family, family, and God bless you all for doing it. And um, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas, a you Happy sir. Holidays, continue success downtown. Thank you. The people enjoy it. And like I said before, we, my wife and I, when we go out for walks, we walk by your store, and we, we're doing it opportunity shopping every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that yeah. we never did unless we went to the yeah. Toll Stool Bookstore. Yeah, another fabulous locally owned business. Yep. In fact, I stopped there today and got three books. It was really great. Yeah, and, and I hope people continue to support them. I know they're a little bit isolated where they are now, but uh, they deserve to be the only bookstore in town, in my opinion. They're a heck of a lot more knowledgeable and helpful than that other big store. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I'm so grateful that you did this. This is just a wonderful thing. As, as you started this by saying, it's just near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know everybody has causes that affect them for a certain reason, but uh, this one affects me, and I'm really grateful for it. So as we get it wrap up, there's over 100,000 families in the United States waiting for organ dona- donations. Every, during the course of this show, four people, the average age of 55, went into congested heart failure who needs an uh, organ donation. Uh, and more and more of those people who need heart transplants are women. It's just not the men anymore. And so if you're really thinking about it, sit down. Talk to your family, and like you said, talk, talk, talk. If you go down and get your license renewed, sign off on it, but make sure your family knows about it. And again, so we'll see you out there on the long road, but have a happy, healthy, and long trip. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.